Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Rick Fleming, um, and I'm here today to give um, a summary of um, some of the highlights of day one of the European meeting of the International Society for Medical Publication Professionals that was held on the 23rd and 24th of January 2018. Um, just some disclosures to start with. Um, I'm co-owner and director of Aspire Scientific. Um, we're an agency that provides publication planning and medical writing support to the pharmaceutical industry. I'm also um, co-owner and director of the Publication Plan Limited. Um, we run um, the publicationplan.com, um, uh, which is a, a not-for-profit um, website um, which provides news um, around medical publications. Um, so yes, um, the European meeting of ISMAP this year was held in the St Paul's area of London um, with approximately 300 attendees this year. Um, the main theme of the meeting was advancing medical publications in a complex evidence ecosystem. Um, some of the sub-themes um, that were particularly evident during the meeting and um, indeed on day one uh, were data transparency, patient centricity and uh, the future of medical publishing. So um, this is the agenda for day one. Um, today I'm going to focus on the presentations in bold, which are mainly those um, in the plenary sessions. Um, and as you can see from the titles, um, they do reflect some of the themes that I've just talked around. So for example, there are um, panel discussions around medical publications and data disclosure, um, future looking presentations um, and panel discussions on um, embracing change in medical publishing and looking at the role of um, artificial intelligence or robots in the future of medical publications. Um, the day began um, with a, a look back at 2017 from Jackie Marchington. Um, she highlighted some of the things, some of the highlights of 2017 in terms of medical publications, including um, the establishment of the Open Pharma Initiative. Um, this basically is a, is a multi-stakeholder initiative um, which has been set up to encourage pharma to more actively participate in discussions on the future of publishing. And it's something that I'll talk about a little bit later as it came up in, in another session. Um, as well in 2017, um, there was the issuing of new draft guidelines for the reporting of industry-sponsored medical research in the form of Congress abstracts and um, presentations. Um, those GP cap um, guidelines or the, the draft version are currently available on the preprint server for review and comment on the PRJ preprints. Um, there was an also uh, towards the end of the year an update from the International Committee of Medical Journal editors on their recommendations for the conduct, reporting, editing and publication of scholarly work. Um, there were various new pieces of information in there, including of particular interest for medical publications professionals, the requirement for specific data sharing statements to be included in articles that are submitted to ICMJE affiliated journals. Um, like, um, like outside of medical publications, fake news, um, you could say also hit the news. Um, so for example, the existence of predatory um, non-reputable medical journals hit the lay press in the New York Times, um, Bloomberg and other, other sources. Um, there was also the report from Trials Tracker from Ben Goldacre and colleagues which reported that 45% of completed trials, clinical trials, um, were not reported on clinicaltrials.gov or PubMed. Um, but there have actually been some, um, some question marks about that automated analysis um, with some subsequent analyses showing that um, a lot of data may actually be elsewhere, so on, um, on um, industry companies' websites, for example. Um, so moving on to the first panel discussion of the day. This was around medical publications and data disclosure, uh, moderated by Russell Trainer. Um, panelists included a selection of people involved in publications and data disclosure at large, large pharmaceutical companies. Um, so this panel discussion discussed some of the challenges involved in um, data disclosure in a large pharmaceutical industry. Um, these included um, the ever-evolving regulatory and cultural environment that surrounds data disclosure. So rightly, things are moving at pace towards more and more disclosure, um, but um, it's quite a challenge to keep up with, with the demands of that. 
Um, there are lo logistical issues in terms of the coordination of data release um, in large companies who often perform multiple clinical trials at various different levels, at regional, at, um, lo at local and at global levels. Um, there are specific challenges around um, maintaining anony anonymity of patient level data, especially in um, rare diseases where pa patients might be relatively easily identifiable, identifiable from their data. And another challenge that was discussed was uh, related to internal resource and communication between different teams. Some of the solutions um, to these challenges that are already in place um, at some of these companies, or no doubt all, um, include um, the establishment of um, robust internal procedures um, to ensure um, timely and accurate dissemination of data, training of staff, um, ensuring that staff uh, take personal responsibility and accountability for their roles. And of course, when you're talking about a large volume of data that needs to be released from a company, you really need efficient information management systems that um, are aligned with each company's SLPs. Um, another solution to some of the challenges um, that are faced within companies in terms of data disclosure has, has really been an increased integration across functional teams. So, for example, um, there's an increasing amount of collaboration between clinical trial or, or other teams, depending on the company, who are responsible for what you might call non-interpretive disclosure, so straightforward disclosure of results on clinicaltrials.gov or other such registries, um, and between the publication teams who manage, again, what you might call interpretive disclosure, so, for example, um, via um, peer-reviewed manuscripts. Um, and yeah, the discussion led to the fact that um, led to the conclusion that we are now in an era where we're moving away from publication planning per se to an integrative data disclosure planning approach. Um, and uh, finally, on this session, just wanted to highlight um, a resource that was highlighted in the session itself. And um, this is the educational series on data and financial transparency that was launched at the back end of 2017 by the ISMAP Global Transparency Committee. Basically, the, the objective of that was to raise awareness amongst um, publication professionals of the very many um, pieces of guidance and policies that are around those topics. And that's available to ISMAP members on the um, member centre of the Society's website. Um, the next panel discussion um, was moderated by Richard Smith, entitled Time to Embrace Change in Medical Publishing. So this is Open Pharma is a multi-stakeholder group as reflected in the list of panellists. So it includes representatives from um, the pharma industry, from medcoms, from publishing and, and from other stakeholders. Um, it, was, it was founded, um, as I said earlier, with a role that um, pharma, um, or with, with a call that pharma should have a greater role in defining the future of publishing um, and um, with the aim of helping to ensure faster and more transparent disclosure of data via pharma. Um, on the initiation of Open Pharma, um, it was reported in this session that four work streams were established, um, including a couple that um, were discussed in more detail in the session itself and I'll also um, briefly summarise now. So one of those work streams is around open access. Um, and um, these are some of the kind of key messages that came out of, the, of those discussions. So um, including the fact that open access isn't only about an article being free to read. Um, really true open access um, allows reuse of the um, publication and the data within it for whichever purposes the user sees fit. Um, related to that, there was a discussion that um, publishers of journals are often unwilling to issue the kind of copyright license that would allow that kind of reuse. So, and most commonly a CCBY license for industry sponsored research. Um, whereas um, other funding bodies such as um, Wellcome Trust and other charitable bodies have mandated um, that their research must be published in open access journals. That's been less, um, that's happened less so in pharma to date, although uh, very significantly on the day of day one of the meeting, Shire announced that um, they'd, inst uh, they'd implemented a policy that all Shire funded research um, must be submitted to um, open access um, journals in the future. 
So we're definitely moving in that direction. Um, a couple of other, uh, or rather the other work stream that was discussed, um, the other Open Pharma work stream was around preprints, post-publication peer review. So these are both models that allow um, faster dissemination of data in slightly different ways. Um, with regard to preprints, um, the medical publication industry has been relatively slow compared with other parts of academia, for example physics, which um, the use of preprints is really quite well established. Um, but of note, there is a, a new preprint pre server um, for medical and health science research called MedArchive being launched this year. Um, there was also a discussion around what journals' attitudes might be to preprints, so specifically if an article has been on a preprint server, um, would peer-reviewed journals then be willing to accept it or would they not consider it original anymore? Um, right now, there are different attitudes to that um, among different journals, um, but um, I think it's really to be determined how that plays out in the future. Um, Post-publication peer review, um, examples of vehicles that use that model include F1000 Research and Welcome Open Research. Um, they have a slightly different model, um, which basically allows articles to be indexed on PubMed or other medical databases once they've passed a certain level of peer review within that vehicle itself. Um, and moving towards the end of the day, there was a debate moderated by Martin Della Hunty entitled, Will We Be Replaced by Robots? Um, so really, th this was a, a, a session that focused on the current and future use of artificial intelligence in medicine and the medical publications field. Uh, Martin began by really highlighting to um, delegates that AI is already here. Um, so for example, there are AI-driven um, drug discovery programs being initiated. Um, through collaborations with large pharmaceutical industries and AI specialists. Um, there are a number of AI-focused startups that focus on the um, relationships between patients and the healthcare system, and it's predicted that um, these kind of AI enhancements in the future will really change the dynamic between the patient and the healthcare professional and really, really empower the patient to take control of, of um, his or her own um, healthcare. In terms of AI in medical publications, um, AI does offer already increased operational speed and efficiency, for example, in terms of um, the, a journal editor. So in other fields, so this example, Subsift, um, was created in Bristol by some computer scientists for one of their journals. Basically, they've um, implemented AI to help them identify suitable peer reviewers that are uh, for articles that are submitted to their journal. Um, AI can also help enhance um, detection of plagiarism, so that's something that um, we already have those systems, but when they're enhanced by AI, they can get even more sensitive. Um, and then the session um, really closed with some um, considerations about what the impact of AI might be in the future for different, um, on different um, stakeholders. So in terms of clinicians themselves, it's thought that at least initially, AI will augment their work rather than play, replace them. Um, looking to the future, it is possible to see that some specialists, uh, particularly those that, for example, um, involve um, recognition of um, different visual patterns, so for example, radiology or other diagnostic specialis specialisms may well be replaced by AI in the future. Uh, there's going to be an impact on AI on the content and delivery of medical education. So the key thing about AI is that it can learn from user interaction. Um, thereby, thereby you can imagine a situation where there are intelligent e-learning platforms where the uh, AI platform begins to predict um, what the user is interested in and um, um, what he or she wants to learn. In terms of the impact on medical publications management, um, we might see a move from systems that support um, SOPs within um, different pharmaceutical companies to those that actually drive and help execute those SOPs. Um, and in conclusion, it was, uh, it was stated that right now, we don't think publication professionals will be replaced, um, but basically to watch this space. And very finally, there were just a few updates at the end of the day on ISMAP itself 
am the um, Certified Medical Publication Professional CMPP accreditation. So um, briefly, um, the presenters at this session um, reported that ISMAP continue, uh, aims to continue to grow its membership through education and collaboration. Um, example, recent examples of successful collaboration have included the joint position statement on the role of the medical writer, um, which was um, an a initiative um, undertaken alongside the American and European Medical Writers Associations. Um, it was, the point was made that ISMAP uh, encourages member-driven research as reflected by the high amount of abstracts and um, subsequently posters that were presented at the meeting itself. Um, in terms of the CMPP accreditation, um, there have been some changes to the exam, um, to the four knowledge domains that are covered. The next exam windows for CMPP are in March and September this year. Um, and um, in terms of recertification, that's going to be on a three-year cycle moving forward. And um, something relatively new is that self-study, um, so primarily online, um, credits for recertification will soon be available. So, um, yeah, that was the highlights from day one of ISMAP. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, if you do have any questions, um, then feel, please feel free to email me. Um, and just wanted to highlight as well that there are written reports of this year's European Meeting of ISMAP on thepublicationplan.com. Thank you.